Okay, welcome to the 11th episode of Franklin, the city skyline series where... Ugh. So I should have done this episode a while back, and I kind of completely skipped it. This is the episode on banking and commerce in the early part of the American Republic. This is going to focus on national politics, not so much with issues specific to the city of Franklin. Some of this stuff you might have gotten in your AP history class in high school, but we're going to do it with a lot less hagiography, right? We're going to tell this story through three buildings. The First Bank of the United States, the Second Bank of the United States, and the Merchants Exchange Building. And we're going to talk about Alexander Hamilton. I, I, I don't care about the musical. You know, it's, more, it's more hagiography. Anyway, so first I want to get us all on the same page here. Money is a store of value, right? It's often held in a thing called a bank. There are many kinds of money. There are many kinds of bank. In a capitalist economy, money is also a pretty good proxy for power, right? So it is useful to understand how the money works in order to understand how the power works. Money and the financial system interact with government and politics, and each shapes the other. You can't get a full picture of how things are run without talking about the money. Okay, in the colonial era, money was very complicated. Every colony issued its own paper money, or bills of credit, and those bills of credit may or may not have been equal to the value of other colonies' similarly denominated bills of credit. So, like, a New York pound might be worth more or less than a Pennsylvania pound, right? And this is not, this is not fiat currency, by the way. These bills of credit were backed by and redeemable for actual specie, or gold and silver, right? You know, that's why the English had the pound sterling, right? It's a bill redeemable for a troy pound of sterling silver. That's the specia, right? But different pounds might be redeemable for different amounts of specia. Furthermore, there could be more bills of credit in circulation than specia available, right? So the actual value could fluctuate. Bills of credit were not the only currencies in circulation. Some people might use Spanish or Portuguese gold or silver coins, right? And those coins were usually the only reliable way different values of bills of credit could be compared to each other, right? These gold and silver specia coins are very important in colonial America since paper money could be just a little bit unreliable, as we'll see. Sometimes commodities were used as money. So that's stuff like tobacco, sugar, rice, whiskey, so on and so forth, right? If cash was hard to come by. Sometimes agricultural products were given formal values by colonial legislatures, and that was called country pay, right? Tended to fluctuate a lot in value, and it was mostly just good for paying taxes, right? So, during the Revolutionary War, the Continental Congress was not very good at monetary policy. This was because... As I mentioned in earlier episodes, the Articles of Confederation were written by drunk libertarians. So, the Continental Congress could issue paper money, but it could not levy taxes, right? Now, it could, however, ask states politely for money. And that worked about as well as it sounded. So, the Continental Congress issued a currency called the Continental, right? And he issued this in large quantities to pay for the Revolutionary War, starting in 1775. Rather than issue pounds, the government issued dollars, right? Since the most common coin in the colonies was a specie coin, the Spanish dollar. These were also known as pieces of eight, or the peso, right? Peso and the dollar are the same thing. Um, so... Continentals were printed in all kinds of weird denominations. You get a third of a dollar, or a $7 bill, or a $55 bill, right? In the meantime, 
the several states continued issuing bills of credit at a very rapid pace, also to fund the war. So the Continental Congress couldn't tax Continentals, so no bills entering circulation were being retired. That meant the money supply just kept getting bigger. And, of course, the British began counterfeiting Continentals, so even more bills entered circulation, right? Hyperinflation followed. Continentals were worth less than a 40th of their face value by 1780, and they ceased to circulate entirely by 1781. The Continental Congress decided to make the states pay their own way through the rest of the war, and the Continental Army, chronically undersupplied and now without access to cash money, just starts to take people's shit and give them IOUs. Okay, so this was not a great system, right? It was not unheard of. Armies taking people's shit was a tradition going back thousands of years, but it's still not a great way to run an army, right? So, luckily, the Battle of Yorktown ended the land war in October of 1781, but supply, currency, and pay problems persisted. So there was this guy, Robert Morris, right? So he was like, he was a rich guy, right? And he had been wheeling and dealing for the Continental Army all up and down the colonies to get supplies in his position as superintendent of finance for the Continental Congress. And he says, this is not a great system. And he persuades the Continental Congress to charter a bank. This was the Bank of North America shenanigans ensued. The Bank of North America had what was effectively the first initial public offering in the nation, and Morris bought a controlling interest. So effectively, we now had a central bank entirely under private control. While Morris was securing foreign financing for his bank, he started to issue paper money of his own. These were called Morris notes, right? And they start circulating pretty widely. So rather than paper money backed by a government or backed by a bank, this is paper money that was just backed by some guy, right? And some people also believe that Morris invented the dollar sign to refer to these notes. So by 1783, Morris's Bank of North America was issuing its own currency, backed by foreign finance and Morris's own investment. And so money was circulating, right? So there was enough money to procure supplies, but not enough to give soldiers back pay, right? Thomas Burke, a delegate from North Carolina, proposed a radical idea. What if the Continental Congress could levy taxes on imported goods to raise revenue for the army, right? Morris was an ardent supporter, as was a delegate from New York. Alexander Hamilton. Now, this required an amendment to the Articles of Confederation, right? And all the colonies except Rhode Island supported it. Amendments had to be unanimous, so that was shut down and the government remained unable to pay its own army. This came to a head on June 20th, 1783, when a group of 500 soldiers mutinied against the Continental Congress and they surrounded the Pennsylvania State House, which we now call Independence Hall. Uh, they were enough in number that they controlled the armory, so they had all the guns, right? The Continental Congress decided to use their appointed power to politely ask the Executive Council of Pennsylvania, which was you know, sort of like a state legislature, they politely asked the Executive Council of Pennsylvania for protection from the mob, and Pennsylvania said no. So the Continental Congress fled to Princeton, New Jersey later the next day, and George Washington sent 1,500 troops to suppress the mutiny a few days later on the 24th. So shit was fucked, and everyone knew it, in short. The next year, Morris threw up his hands and resigned all his government positions. Hamilton, on the other hand, saw opportunity. He started posting. Under the handle Publius, Hamilton, J. 
John Jay and James Madison make the case for a new government in a massive tweet thread we now know as the Federalist Papers. Now, Shay's Rebellion really cemented the death of the Articles of Confederation. That was when unpaid and indebted Continental Army soldiers attempted to overthrow the government of Massachusetts, and the Continental Congress couldn't raise revenue to pay soldiers to put down the rebellion of unpaid soldiers. So instead, George Washington had to lead a state militia of Bostonians to attack the rebellion in Springfield. So, blah, 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 Constitutional Convention, blah, 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 Bill of Rights, blah, 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 we the people, in order to form a more perfect union, blah, 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 we get a federal government with more powers of taxation, and under the Contracts Clause, states were prevented from issuing their own currency. The next order of business was to figure out exactly how fucked up the shit was. Hamilton, who was now Secretary of the Treasury, set out to find out, and he produced a 40,000-word document called The First Report on the Public Credit. This was in 1789. So they figured they got $40 million in domestic debt, $12 million in foreign debt, and the 13 states owed $25 million on their accounts. Right. So... Congress passed a tariff to pay down these debts fairly quickly and easily. But here comes the curveball. No one suggested anything other than paying the foreign debt in full with interest, right? But there were some other ideas of how to handle the domestic debt, right? Most of the domestic debt was either loans offered by private individuals to cover war expenses or back pay for soldiers. All right, so the first idea was repudiation. We'll just default to keep taxes low. What are they going to do anyway? This isn't the same government, folks. We have no obligation to pay you. The second idea was discrimination. Okay, so many soldiers were paid in IOUs towards the end of the war, and these were to be paid once the government had its finances in order. Now, these were worthless scrip under the Articles of Confederation, and many soldiers sold them to speculators so they'd actually see some cash, sometimes for 10 cents on the dollar, right? Discrimination offered to pay soldiers in full for their IOU and refund the speculators the purchase price. This meant that the debt burden would actually be higher than $40 million. This was championed by James Madison, who believed soldiers deserved their pay, whatever the interim economic conditions, though he had a modified plan which did not increase the debt burden. Then came Hamilton's idea, presented in the report, redemption. Just pay the current bearer of the IOU for its face value, to preserve the sacredness of the contract, and also to not increase the debt. Alright, so... The report was made public on January 9th, 1790, and speculators in New York and Philadelphia immediately sent buyers by fast boats to the southern states to beat the news of the report and to buy up as many IOUs from veterans for the lowest price as possible. Meanwhile, vigorous debate over the ethics and merits of redemption and discrimination went on for days with impassioned arguments from both sides. Oh, wait, no. Discrimination was immediately shot down in Hamilton's Plan 1, 36-13. The United States started screwing over veterans fairly early on. They skipped this part in the Hamilton musical for some reason. Okay, right. So, the actual debate was on the federal government's assumption of state debts. Now, states with a lot of debt, which were mostly the northern states... Uh, were very much in favor of this. And states with not a lot of debt, the southern states, they, they were very much against this, since it meant they'd be paying more in debt service than they were before, right? In the meantime, there was also vigorous debate over the location of the new federal district, right, to house the nation's capital. It wasn't going to be located in any one state, 
since Pennsylvania's failure to protect the Continental Congress was still fresh on everyone's mind, right? Right, so Hamilton brokered an agreement in a backroom deal, which later came to be known as the Dinner Party Bargain, right? And that moved the capital to its current location, Washington, D.C., in exchange for Southern states supporting Assumption. Also, Thomas Jefferson and James Madison did some financial fuckery and effectively wiped out Virginia's debt obligations in this deal, right? So this all worked spectacularly well. Foreign capital snapped up treasury bonds, and a fully funded government was finally able to exercise political power. Hamilton drafted up some excise taxes, uh, among which he considered the least objectionable to be an excise tax on whiskey. Now, these taxes were all rejected, right? Who, who taxes domestic product? That's weird. It was weird at the time, at least. So, Hamilton's not done yet. The second report on public credit was published in late 1790, arguing for the establishment of a public bank, the first bank of the United States, whose building I was doing in the earlier part of this video. Right, so, Hamilton wanted a central bank that issued all the currency, that offered loans for economic development, loan money to the government, to be the single national bank in existence, right? Now, states could still charter private intrastate banks, but this would be the only national bank, right? And this bank would last for 20 years, and then Congress had to renew its charter. So the proposal was simple. Okay, the bank would issue $10 million in stock, $2 million of which would be owned by the federal government. The federal government didn't have $2 million, so the bank would first loan the federal government $2 million, which the government would then use to buy $2 million worth of stock from the bank and then pay the interest on it, right? Are you following this? Okay, good. The remaining $8 million would be bought by private investors, foreign and domestic, with at least $2.5 million paid in gold or silver specia, right? Okay. All right, so how are we going to pay interest on that $2 million loan, right? Hamilton again suggested his least objectionable proposal, right? An excise tax on whiskey. He expected the support of the temperance movement, right? Who could be against a sin tax? So the bank bill passed 37 to 20. So, it turned out Hamilton made a pretty significant sin tax error, right? Remember back to what I said in episode 3. American colonists were habitually drunk. So, and by this time, hard currency was commonly available in the East. But in the West, and by West I mean, you know, around the Ohio River, in the West the local currency was whiskey, right? So in other words... Hamilton's whiskey excise tax was an income tax, and it was an income tax that only applied to poor Westerners, many of whom were veterans who had sold their IOUs to investors, and those investors just got a big payout, right? Large distillers could afford the tax, but small distillers, especially Western ones, could not. In some states like Kentucky, the local officials refused to enforce the tax. In other states like Pennsylvania, they did enforce the tax, and the locals got mad. They started by tarring and feathering tax collectors, then they began an open rebellion. So Hamilton's least objectionable tax caused the Whiskey Rebellion in western Pennsylvania. So George Washington had to lead an army of Philadelphians to go put down a rebellion in Pittsburgh. Ah, oh, shit. Here we go again. The miracle that this country held together. Also, they skipped this part in the Hamilton musical for some reason. Right, so the First Bank of the United States operated out of Carpenter's Hall for a while. Which, I don't understand. What, why is Carpenter's Hall made of, made of brick? Shouldn't it be made of wood? I don't know. 
Anyway, so and then it eventually moved to its own building 200 feet east of Carpenter's Hall in 1795. We're not going to talk about the building too much. It's designed by Samuel Blodgett, sort of vaguely neoclassical, sort of vaguely Greek revival, made of Pennsylvania blue marble, but it's brick around the sides, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so Thomas Jefferson and James Madison start to think that Hamilton, you know Hamilton? He brought in a whole bunch of money, but only for a very small number of people. He impoverished the West. He fucked over veterans. He caused an open rebellion. They start to think he's a, a dumb moron, idiot asshole, right? And Jefferson and Madison and their supporters, mostly from agrarian communities, form a political party called the Democratic Republicans. Now, a faction of this party later became the modern Democratic Party. But, of course, just to confuse everyone, at the time, many people called this party simply the Republicans. Right? Right. Okay. Supporters of Hamilton, meanwhile, become the Federalists. In 1794, John Adams wins the presidency under the Federalist banner. In 1800, Hamilton tries to run for president against the Federalist nominee incumbent John Adams. Now, Thomas Jefferson, the Democratic Republican, wins pretty handily there. Um, then Alexander Hamilton was shot dead by Vice President Aaron Burr. Jefferson won another term. James Madison won the next election, also a Democratic Republican. And at this point, the first bank's charter is up for renewal. Private banks had lobbied Congress to reject the renewal of the bank's charter, and the Senate tied. James Madison's vice president, George Clinton, cast the tie-breaking vote, and he shot Hamilton's bank dead. A very rich man, who will be the subject of the next episode, Stephen Girard, buys the first bank of the United States and all its assets. I mean... Imagine if some guy just bought the Federal Reserve, and that's what happened. And we were back to chaos and pandemonium, with individual banks issuing their own currencies and bills of credit, you know, instead of states, right? Which is an even more confusing system than what existed in the colonies. Few of these banknotes were directly convertible with each other. Dollars were worth entirely different amounts depending on who issued them, and of course, even finding out how much a dollar from one bank was worth compared to others was difficult. You know, there's no internet or anything back then. So, in the meantime, a few things happened, right? One of which was the Louisiana Purchase in 1803. That cost $15 million, and it was financed by $3 million in gold and silver from the bank, and the balance was made up by bonds, right? And then we had the War of 1812, which notably occurred after Girard had bought the first bank. So the Treasury financed the war with $16 million in bonds, which Girard underwrote. Also, during the war, the Federalist Party collapsed, which left only the Democratic Republicans, and they were starting to come around to the idea of a national bank, right? Maybe having entire wars financed by patriotic millionaires wasn't a great idea. And this was the beginning of what was known as the era of good feelings, right? When the party system sort of disappeared and President James Monroe toured the country for the sake of nonpartisan goodwill. But then along came 1816. It is a doozy of a year. It's known as Poverty Year, the year without a summer, or 1800 and froze to death. Uh, it was a very cold year. Uh, snow fell in June in Albany. This is because Mount Tambora, you know, big dumb volcano, had erupted the previous year, right? And the ash cloud had completely enveloped the earth and it blotted out the sunlight, right? This was not good for growing crops, especially in Europe. You know, Europe in general is much farther north than the United States. Uh, Venice is about the same latitude as Montreal. Most crops in Europe completely failed. And so there was a significant demand for food, you know, because of starvation and stuff. Now, most food couldn't make the transatlantic journey. However, there was also a significant demand for cotton, which could make 
transatlantic journey. And its very high prices meant very tidy profits for plantation owners. High prices for agricultural goods also fueled land speculation in general, right? So frontiersmen set off to make an honest living off the rugged frontier, which means they bought the land and sat on it and waited for the price to go up so they could sell it, right? Right. So this speculation was funded by largely unregulated banks who were issuing their own banknotes backed up with varying amounts of specie, right? A lot of people were making a lot of money, whatever that meant, and they were making it very quickly. But it didn't take a genius to see that, you know, there's a problem developing here. And you should also keep in mind people already lived out on the frontier, right? They were called Native Americans. They had been living there for thousands of years. And to fuel the speculative bubble that drove the American economy in the 1810s, they had to go. Now, we're going to talk about this in depth later on, but this was achieved through a combination of dirty tricks, illegitimate treaties, and straight-up violence with a thin veneer of legality on top to disguise the atrocities, right? Right. So, anyway, the first bank was a rousing success, and bringing back a unified currency was very popular with businessmen and capitalists, so why not charter a second one? Now, James Madison signed the charter in 1817 on his way out of office, and the second bank of the United States became a reality. And that meant it needed a building. All right, let me get the let me get the the projector out here. Hold on a second. All right, let's talk about Greek revival, American democracy, and William Strickland. Right? Okay. So, in our last episode, we talked about neoclassicism. We talked about prisons, and we talked about the architecture of social control. Right? Today we're going to talk about a sub-discipline of neoclassicism. That's Greek Revival. And I always think Greek Revival is an interesting contrast between the values the architecture is purported to represent versus the actual use of the buildings. Right. So, on to ancient Athens. Ne next slide, please. Right. So... Back in the day, 600s BC or so, Athens was a city-state, and it had one of the earliest known democracies, right? This was direct democracy, not a representative republic, right? Its main governing body, the Ecclesia, was just formed of whoever showed up that day. Now, there were a few requirements. You had to be a free male citizen, you had to be physically present to vote, right? That was, that was basically it. Sometimes it was hard to get people to show up to Ecclesia because it was a big, long, boring meeting, right? So they had to force people to attend. Eventually, they started paying people to show up, and Ecclesia got more popular. Um, executive positions in ancient Athens were either appointed by the Ecclesia or they were chosen by sortition, right? which means you just picked someone's name out of a hat. Now, most of the founding fathers of the United States thought Athenian democracy was a pretty bad system, right? They referred to it as mob rule, and they thought too much democracy would lead to a tyranny of the many over the few. You may have heard this before. It's usually trotted out to defend undemocratic elements of the American Republic, as being necessary to protect the rights of minorities, but what this actually meant was that too much democracy might lead to multitudes of poor people gaining and exercising power over the rich. And this is why the American Constitution was much more closely modeled on Roman practices, you know, with representative government and a Senate and all that stuff instead of direct democracy. You know, senators weren't even directly elected until 1913. They were appointed by state legislatures before that. You know, American democracy is and has always been explicitly undemocratic. And that's because of reasons. Right? Right. So, so Athenian democracy was not looked on as a positive model for governance until after 
the American Republic had been established. It was also not well studied because all of Greece was locked behind the impenetrable wall of the Ottoman Empire, so Western scholars couldn't get in. Most of what we knew about Athenian democracy came from Plato's criticisms of it, and of course Plato didn't have a very high opinion of the system since it murdered Socrates, right? But anyway, the Athenians, they had democracy, right? So the Athenians met on a hill called the Nix to do democracy. Now, none of the buildings associated with that process survive. So instead, one of Athens' most enduring symbols is the Parthenon. Uh, next slide, please. Hold on, let me, let me focus this. Hold on. So, right, the Parthenon is a big temple on a hill called the Acropolis, right? And that hill has a few other significant ruins on it as well. Um, so this building was continuously occupied by various groups throughout the vast majority of its history. It's been burned down a couple times. It's also fairly regularly destroyed and rebuilt. It was a temple to Athena throughout antiquity. It was closed in the 5th century. It was reopened in the 6th century as a Christian church. And when they did that, they added a little steeple and an apse. And it remained a Christian church until the 1400s when it was converted into a mosque under the Ottomans, right? And they put a minaret on it. Okay, so in the late 1600s, the Venetians were fighting the Ottoman Turks over Greece for the sixth time, right? This is a spat that went back to the Crusades. Now, in 1687, the Turks decided to fortify the whole Acropolis since... You know, it's the high ground, right? And they decided to use the Parthenon as an ammunition dump. So the Venetians shelled it. It blew up. It's still blown up to this day. Next slide, please. So the Ottoman Empire started going into a nasty economic decline after this last war. And as a result, they were a little more willing to allow foreigners access to their empire to get those sweet, sweet tourism bucks, right? One of their great attractions was the newly ruined Acropolis. So in the second half of the 18th century, well-to-do Europeans came from all over to see these new ruins, sketch the ruins, learn about Athenian society and democracy, and be inspired, and so on and so forth, right? And again, keep in mind, these Greek ruins were all but inaccessible before, compared to the widely known ruins in Rome, right? There's a big novelty factor here. Next slide, please. So, Greek revival, the highest stage of neoclassicism. What is it? What makes it different from earlier neoclassicism? So, while neoclassicism had focused on Roman forms, Greek revival restricts its architectural vocabulary to forms which the Greeks were aware of and used. So that means no arches, very restrained ornamentation, and lots of temple fronts. And I mean lots of temple fronts. Next slide, please. In America, the Greek revival style was strongly associated with secularism, equality, and democracy. So naturally, it was applied to churches, plantation houses, and banks, respectively. So, we'll start with an English immigrant, Benjamin Henry Latrobe. So, Latrobe mostly worked on projects we'd now classify as civil engineering, right? That was back in England. He worked on canals and on navigations. A, a navigation is just a series of public works to make an existing river navigable by boats, right? Um, but Latrobe also designed a few stately homes. Now, he came to America via Norfolk, Virginia in 1796, but he soon moved to Richmond and then on to Philadelphia, right? Next slide, please. So, when he moved to Philadelphia, he designed the Bank of Pennsylvania building, right? Built 1799. So, we can see here very clearly, this is a temple front. Now, this went up just five years after Blodgett's first bank, the United States. And at first glance, you might compare these two buildings and say, 
well, they're not so different, right? They're both temple fronts. They're both made of the same material, blah, blah, blah. But they are different, right? Blodgett's first bank has elaborate ornamentation, specifically around a fenestration. A fenestration is a fancy architecture word for the order and arrangement of windows, right? And also the root of the word defenestrate, right? Which means to throw out of a window, right? The useful vocabulary there. Um, Latrobe's Bank of Pennsylvania does not have that ornamentation, right? And has many fewer windows overall. Bank of Pennsylvania also uses simpler columns. Overall, there's less ornamentation. There's fewer columns. There's no pilasters. There's a simpler entablature. Instead of ornament, there's high-quality materials. They use stone as opposed to brick for all sides of the building. Right? Next slide, please. Okay, so Latrobe is famous mostly for work outside of Philadelphia, since all his Philadelphia buildings have been demolished, save for a porter's house in Fairmount Park. Now, he later moved to Washington to work on the U.S. Capitol. A lot of interiors are of his design, as are the Greek porticos of the White House. He also worked in Baltimore, where he designed the enormous Basilica of the National Shrine of the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary. That's the building you see on the screen here, right? Okay. Later on, he moved to New Orleans, and he went to work on a waterworks project there, and that was with famed architect-slash-city-planner-slash-engineer-slash-pirate Bartholomew Lafon. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is William Strickland. He worked in Latrobe's offices before starting his own firm in 1805. In 1818, he received the commission for the building you see in the rear of this photo. Not photo, it's a picture. Picture, it's a painting. Painting is what it is. Not a photo. Anyway, um, the building you see in the rear of this picture, the second bank of the United States. And this is the first of many American Parthenons. Next slide, please. Okay, so here's the second bank of the United States, located at 420 Blaze at Chestnut Street. It's simple, stately, big, dumb temple front, right? Big Doric columns. No windows. Who needs them? Minimal ornamentation. All the same material. Pennsylvania blue marble. Also known as King of Prussia marble. Because it was quarried there in King of Prussia, Pennsylvania. Right at the intersection of Gulf Road and Croton Road. Underneath this lumber dealer. Next slide, please. So we go to the side. We see an even more austere treatment. There's no ornament around the fenestration. There's no obvious lintels. There's only the barest indication of sills. Keep in mind, this facade was not very visible when the building was put up. The National Park Service later demolished most of the buildings between 3rd and 6th Streets in the name of historic preservation. That is back in the 1950s. That's another episode. Possibly, if these facades were more exposed, there would be a colonnade or something here, but that's speculation on my part. Next slide, please. So Strickland's design for the second bank was clearly inspired by the Parthenon, right? Greek revival proved adaptable to other purposes, though. So this is the third street facade of the Merchants Exchange Building. This was the first stock exchange in America. It was opened in 1834. Again, we're looking at a temple front, but this time with slightly more ornament. Strickland uses Corinthian columns instead of Doric, and this temple front is buttressed by two bays of windows. Some concessions were made to increase the amount of lighted floor area here, right? And once again, the building is faced in Pennsylvania blue marble. The much more famous... Uh, next slide, please. Much more famous is the facade facing the intersection of Dock Street and Walnut Street, which is a big semicircular portico. Okay. So, there's nothing like this in Greek antiquity, to my knowledge. The lantern on top is a near copy of the tragic monument of Lysidocrates, but the big Corinthian portico is something entirely brand new. So, you know, this is a very impressive piece of architecture. It's designed in the Greek Revival style, and this leads to local papers saying things like, 
Philadelphia is the Athens of America and stuff like that, right? But this is a commercial building, right? It has a stock exchange. It had offices. It had a coffee shop. It had more offices. You know, it's not like a government building or a big civic institution, right? There's hardly anything democratic about what's going on in there. Certainly not in the Athenian democracy sense of the word. Next slide, please. Right, so Strickland designed a few more buildings in Philadelphia, like the 1836 Mechanics National Bank, which we all now know as National Mechanics, which is a bar which is too loud at night, right? Um, Strickland later moved to Tennessee. Uh, next slide, please. And when he was in Tennessee, he built his magnum opus, the Tennessee State Capitol. You can see there's another tragic monument of Lysidocrates on the top there. So, you know, obviously Greek revival was used for government buildings too, but that's not the focus of this episode. So now we know a bit about Greek revival architecture, let's get to the fate of that fundamentally undemocratic institution, the Second Bank of the United States. Okay, so here's the theory of operation. The Second Bank of the United States was effectively the depository for the U.S. Treasury. So there were a lot of private banknotes in circulation from various private banks, and these were often inflated in value, or they were backed up by insufficient reserves of specie, or they were otherwise untrustworthy, right? So the Second Bank would accept these private banknotes for payment of taxes by companies or private individuals at face value, right? They would then credit that amount of specie, that's gold or silver coins, to the United States Treasury. The United States Treasury could then spend that specie as directed by Congress. In order to replenish its own reserves of specie, the Second Bank of the United States would take the banknotes, which they had been given in payment for taxes, and they would go to the bank which issued those notes, and they would redeem them for specia, right? And they would deposit that specia in their own reserves. So this would restore convertibility, right? Private banknotes would be able to be exchanged for other private banknotes. Um, effectively, a dollar would finally become worth one of itself. This would also cause private banks to restrict their lending so they didn't become too indebted to the Second Bank of the United States, right? Banks which were unable to make payments of specie would not have their banknotes accepted by the second bank for payment of taxes. Now, this didn't directly make them completely worthless, but it tended to signal that a bank was insolvent, right? People don't want to use money that they can't pay taxes in, so this usually ended in a bank run and bankruptcy. Now, the Second Bank of the United States would also lend money to regular folks to purchase government land out west and provide for an orderly western expansion, right? An added effect of these policies was that it would tend to reduce the amount of banknotes in circulation, since, as we mentioned earlier, overlending would finally have consequences for banks. And this would reduce or reverse inflation, right? Now, this is an example of government using monetary policy to extend the reach of its power and influence, in this case to regulate banks and further legitimize existing wealth. So, the bank was chartered with a requirement for $28 million in specie, you know, gold or silver coins, as its reserve. They scrounged up $2 million by the time operations began. 18 branches were built, some as far west as the newly admitted state of Ohio. These branches all operated independently. So this was a problem. Western branches began emulating the state banks they were intended to regulate. Frontier farmers were offered credit by the second bank branches in the west to purchase federal lands, but they were offered this credit at a rate much quicker than those branches' specie reserves could keep up with. Those same branches remained solvent by using their own banknotes to redeem specie from the branches back east, right? 
this over lending caused major problems for the second bank's regulatory function, right? Second bank branches in the West tried to redeem banknotes for specie from the state chartered private banks, right? But since they had overextended their credit, too many second bank banknotes were in circulation. These private banks would simply redeem enough specie from the second bank with second bank banknotes and then pay the second bank with the specie they just redeemed. Right, so, the European harvest was very good in 1817. So was the American harvest. Food prices dropped. So did land values, especially in the West. Britain's textile mills began importing cotton from India instead of from the United States, dropping the price and quantity of America's major export and exacerbating a trade deficit which was already draining specie from the country. In 1818, payment for bonds from the Louisiana Purchase was due. Most of that payment went to foreign creditors, so specie was required for payment. So that was about $2 million of specie, and it came from the reserves of the Second Bank. Now, prior to this, the Second Bank accepted private banknotes as payment for loan interest. This practice ended in August 1818. Private banknotes were now only accepted as payment for taxes, and all other payments, mostly for land mortgages, had to be paid in either second bank banknotes or specie. Right, so the second bank begins specie demands in earnest, and overextended western banks start to have to call in their loans and foreclose on land. The land boom was over, and everyone was in debt up to their eyeballs. And no quarter was given any longer to, say, a farmer who was too cash poor to make payments because food prices had fallen, right? In 1819, the price of cotton finally collapsed. It dropped 25% in a day. This was the Panic of 1819, one of many such panics to come. Manufacturing collapsed. Uh, private banks failed, and their banknotes became worthless, and the country slipped into a deep depression that lasted until 1822. The only institution that came out on top was the Second Bank of the United States, which, through tight monetary policy, had replenished its specie reserves, restored convertibility for the banks which continued to exist, and set itself on a rock-solid financial foundation for the remainder of its charter. Its political foundation, as a result, became a little shakier. States attempted to levy taxes on the bank's assets, which led to the landmark Supreme Court case McCullough v. Maryland, which established that states cannot tax the federal government. This kept the bank in place for now, but its charter was up for renewal in 1836, and political tides were shifting. The panic had been caused by factors well outside the bank's control, and even if it had been managed more wisely, um, the post-Napoleonic depression would have reared its ugly head regardless. However, people were still pissed off at the bank. The perception among anti-bank politicians, and especially southern landowners, that the bank had exacerbated or even caused the panic led to the end of the era of good feelings and the rise of a new political faction, the Jacksonian Democrats, led by Andrew Jackson. Right, so the Jacksonian Democrats are a pretty mixed bag. One of their main beefs was with the Second Bank, and that's what we're going to talk about most here, but there were other significant causes they were for. First and foremost was universal white manhood suffrage. Okay, so we like to think that Initially, only white men were given the franchise, and we expanded voting rights from there. But actually, in the early republic, they weren't that generous. So, there were many restrictions on the franchise in many states, primarily based on wealth or land ownership, right? Sometimes you couldn't hold office if you didn't have a minimum amount of wealth, right? The Jacksonians wanted to remove these restrictions and give the franchise to all white males. That's, uh, that's incrementalism, folks. Okay. They were also in favor of the manifest destiny of America. You know, the nation goes from sea to shining sea and all that stuff. 
they liked the patronage system, you know, where you give some do nothing jobs to your cronies. They thought that was a good idea. They were strict constructionists. No, constructionists in the legal sense. They supported judges interpreting laws exactly as they were written and supported laissez faire economics, right? No government subsidies for roads and railroads and canals. And they were all about being elected by the common man and were against rich guys who controlled the banking and political system. So, 1824 was a doozy of an election. Four candidates squared off, all nominally of the same Democratic-Republican Party. There was John Quincy Adams, Andrew Jackson, William H. Crawford, and Henry Clay. Andrew Jackson won a plurality of the electoral votes, and he won the popular vote, but no candidate won a majority, so the House of Representatives picked from the top three. They selected John Quincy Adams, and everyone got mad. You know, this whole popular vote thing has never worked especially well in the United States. Um, Adams was an ex-Federalist, and he worked to concentrate more power into the federal government, and he also got major infrastructure projects going, like the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad and a whole bunch of canals. He also kept an alligator at the White House. Now, as part of Adams's quasi-federalist government, the tariff of 1828 was passed by Congress. This was a 38% tariff on foreign goods and a 45% tariff on imported raw materials, right, designed to protect northern industry. Southern landowners hated it, since they benefited from cheap imported goods. So, in 1828, Andrew Jackson squared off against John Quincy Adams and won pretty decisively, especially in the South. Okay, so Jackson's first term had a whole bunch of stuff happen. He signed the Tariff of 1828, which came to be known as the Tariff of Abominations, and South Carolina attempted to nullify it. Right, so this was a big mess, and there was almost an armed confrontation between the federal government and the state militia, but a compromise was reached in the form of the Tariff of 1833, which is a little bit lower. Andrew Jackson also passed the Indian Removal Act, which was, you know, a, a genocide bill. We're, we'll talk about it more in the next episode, but it gave what Americans and Europeans referred to as the five civilized tribes, right? The Cherokee, the Creek, the Chickasaw, the Choctaw, and the Seminole. Uh, it gave them strict time limits to move to Indian territory, which is now Oklahoma, or else the government was going to send in the troops. Uh, this, of course, resulted in the Trail of Tears, which were forced marches for hundreds of miles in midwinter, which killed a whole lot of people. Not good. So by the late 1820s and early 1830s, anti-bank sentiment was less prevalent, right? The Panic of 1819 was ancient history, and U.S. currency was stable. Jackson left the bank alone for most of his first term. Rumors abounded, however, that bank officials had attempted to secure John Quincy Adams' re-election with bank resources. Uh, the bank war was on. Okay, let's look at the players. On the pro-bank side, Nicholas Biddle, director of the bank. Henry Clay, presidential candidate, 1828, Democratic-Republican Party, and presidential candidate, 1832, anti-Jacksonian party. And keep in mind, all these folks are nominally part of the same Democratic-Republican Party. Um, also, the vast majority of the American people able to vote who benefited from stable currency. That included most capitalists who were not in the developing field of finance. Meanwhile, on the anti-bank side, there was an unholy alliance of Western farmers and Eastern financiers. Okay, so both of these groups wanted entirely different and incompatible things. Hard currency and easy credit, respectively. Both of them saw the bank as an obstacle to those goals. In addition, there were state-chartered private banks, right, and they resented the second bank's regulatory influence. And there was Andrew Jackson, who disputed the constitutionality of the bank in public and who thought it was irredeemably corrupt in private. So, after a failed compromise in 1831, 
The anti-Jacksonians and Nicholas Biddle tried to force the issue in 1832 by putting a bill to recharter the bank up for a vote in Congress. Right? It passed pretty handily, and Andrew Jackson took the unprecedented step of vetoing the bill. Right? So, no one had vetoed a bill for political reasons before this. Um, an attempt to override failed, and the bank's rechartering was now a political football, uh, the wedge issue for the 1832 elections. All right, so a bunch of boring politicking happens, right? Okay, the anti-Jacksonians nominate Henry Clay. Jackson decisively beats him. Jackson is re-elected. Time to wreck the bank. Jackson starts by removing most public deposits from the bank and instead housing them in various uh, private banks friendly to the Jackson administration. Opponents call them pet banks since they serve to finance Jackson and his friends pet projects, right? Biddle responds by raising interest rates and calling in loans. A brief panic ensues and the economy slumps. Biddle tries to pin it on Jackson and Jackson firmly pins it on Biddle. You know, because he had all the money. Opposition started building, right? The Whig Party was organized to oppose Jackson. Now, the Whigs were named after the Whigs in Britain, who opposed the monarchy, right? The American Whigs see Jackson, you know, Andrew Jackson, you know, the, the proponent of democracy, limited government, expanding the franchise, uh, firmly against central banking, hero of the common man, so on and so forth. They see Jackson as a tyrant. In 1834, the Whigs use their power and influence in the Senate to formally censure the president. O okay, right. Let's talk about censure. If Congress censures a Congress critter, they have to give up their committee chairs, and that can be a major drop in stature. But it's not expulsion. You can keep serving as a Congress critter. Now, if Congress censures someone else, like the president, it basically amounts to saying, Sir? Sir? How dare you? And nothing else happens. This was absolutely the case in 1834. The deposits remained in private banks, the second bank remained neutered, and the economy began to recover on its own. Recharter efforts were abandoned. The remainder of public deposits were removed from the bank. Following this, Jackson paid off the entire national debt. The bank's charter expired in 1836, and it was reorganized as a private bank chartered in the state of Pennsylvania. That went bust in 1841. Jackson's censure was expunged in 1837. For his efforts to stop central banking and his stance against unified currency, he is memorialized on the $20 bill. And the country returned to the previous status quo. Chaos and pandemonium in banking, dozens of banks with dozens of differently valued banknotes, and easy but unreliable credit available to everyone. Record profits and overextension of credit led to the Panic of 1837 and a recession that lasted until 1844. Central banking as we know it would not return to the United States until the Federal Reserve was created in 1913. All right, so that was a history of the U.S. economy from slightly before the Revolution to the Panic of 1837, right? How does this relate to the city of Franklin? So it, it, it relates quite a lot, right? The establishment of the first and second banks of the United States make the city the financial capital of the United States and led to the first stock exchange, uh, which was large enough to have to move out of a tavern and into its own building, right? The location of the bank meant, of course, that merchants had a lot of access to the bank's directors and could more easily secure financing for their own ventures. So, in short, access to money was cheap and easy, travel was slow, and these places weren't so big, right? You know, the whole population of Franklin or Philadelphia could easily fit in Beaver Stadium, right? You know, which admittedly is a very large stadium, but, you know, it's still, still like, comprehensibly large. Um, and as a result, gaining political or financial influence wasn't so difficult. So, Philadelphia, or Franklin, was the place you went if you wanted financing for your canal, or your turnpike, or your railroad, 
or whatever business venture. And this state of affairs persisted until the collapse of the bank, at which point finance moved up to the place with the next most money, uh, New York City, and it stayed there. Or I guess since, you know, this is a City Skyline series, uh, Gramercy, that's the Squicklehausen series. Um, but that's, that's how that relates to the city of Franklin. Um, anyway, so that was the episode. Here is the commercial. Sorry about the wait for this episode. If you're mad at me, you can leave a nasty comment, and then I'll read it, and I'll feel bad. On the other hand, if you like the series, you can give me a dollar on my Patreon, which should occasionally get you a bonus episode available only to Patreons, and also gets you early access to the drafts of these episodes, right? Um, and if you like just hearing me talk, you can also go to my other project, Well, There's Your Problem, a podcast with slides about engineering disasters. And that thing updates a lot more frequently uh, than, than this series because it's easier to make. Um, in addition, shout out to Big Mood Energy, uh, who is doing a City Skyline series called... Hold on, it's a long name. i got to look this up. Uh, right, yes, this failure and success of Great American Transit. Right, it's a long name. Um, you know, kind of similar to the to to this series, where it's very in depth on history, um, and you know the actual things that make stuff work. So, you know, if you like this sort of content, you should go over there and listen to watch her channel. She actually has a video premiering right after this one. It's on Metro. It's gonna be cool. Go over there. Anyway, okay. Um, right back to the script. Um, okay. Uh, assets that I created for this episode should be up on Steam by the time this episode is uploaded, so you can go download that stuff, right? Uh, it, now, if you want to follow me on Twitter, you can't do that anymore, because they banned me, because I threatened to do the Punic Wars to someone who insulted my friend's mom. Um, you know, and obviously doing the Punic Wars is a serious thing I could follow through with, owing to my command of several dozen uh, Roman legions. But anyway, the next episode is going to be about Stephen Gerrard, racism, genocide, and the buildings of Thomas Ustick Walter. Um, so, let's roll the cinematics and the credits. <laughs>